Very happy and honored to welcome uh, Beth Johnson and David Forrest, who wrote a fantastic book on uh, the representation of social class in contemporary uh, TV in Britain. And I will now give the floor to them to tell you more about this. Thank you very much. Um, my name is David Forrest. I'm a lecturer at the University of Sheffield. Um, so our book, Social Class and Television Drama in Contemporary Britain, was published last year and it brings together um, 17 chapters from a selection of academics who work in the United Kingdom, including contributions from myself and Beth, and explores the many ways in which British television drama continues to construct to represent and to reflect social class in Britain. Our book acknowledges um, heritage and realism as kind of the governing presences of film and television culture in Britain, but it tries to move beyond those, those binaries. So the chapters offer engagements with um, established and underexplored um, areas of uh, social class in Britain. We look at writers such as Steph, Steph, Stephen Polikoff, Jimmy McGovern, Shane Meadows, and sit alongside case studies of television performers, actors like Maxine Peake, like Jimmy Nail and Vicky McClure, and genres, the sitcoms and forms such as animation. Um, when we look at recent series like Peaky Blinders, This Is England. Um, but we also try and look at uh, more popular examples of television drama that haven't perhaps been explored through academic lenses, such as Goodnight Sweetheart and Footballers' Wives. Our aim with the book was to develop a class project on an oppositional access and to restore the kind of concerns of class, placing them firmly back on academic, on national, on cultural maps. And despite the digital growth of television, television drama, we argue, remains a deeply significant site for the formula formulation of class identity, along with those attendant questions of the local, of the regional, and of the historical. Is that a slide clicker? Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so the key questions the book asks then, what is the state of British television drama in a broad sense. What can we learn about identity from the television drama of the last 20 years? So we conceive contemporary Britain um, as uh, beginning almost with 1997 for, for obvious reasons perhaps. And in what ways do television texts perform or resist particular ideological positions? What can television drama do to and with class? Is class identity or struggle utilised as a dramatic device in contemporary television drama? How can class be identified in the textual fabric and form of television? What do these class representations make us feel? So this afternoon we'd like to offer an insight into the analytical process that we undertook in the book and to make some arguments and draw some conclusions about social class and television drama in the process by presenting two readings of recent British dramas that explore and reflect these questions of social class in, we think, quite fascinating ways. So I'll pass over to Beth now for a bit. Okay, we're going to tag team. So I'm going to do a case study and then Dave will do um, a second case study. Um, right, so there are sort of key questions that we were asking and trying to answer um, uh, in the book. Um, the, the first sort of case study that I'd like to explore today um, is uh, the British uh, drama, crime drama series, Happy Valley. Um, this was produced uh, by um, Red Productions, uh, who are based in Manchester in the north of England, um, and is a series written by the fantastic um, Sally Wainwright, who um, won a BAFTA uh, for this. It first aired on the BBC in 2014. 
This particular series um, was conceptualized as a crime drama, um, and the first series um, uh, was essentially six episodes, each around 55 minutes. Um, they tell the story of the figure that we can see here, so um, Catherine Kaywood, um, and it's essentially her story that's central to this particular, um, to this particular sort of uh, series or serial. Um, Kaywood is played by Sarah Lancashire, um, and in the series, she's a working police officer living and laboring in the Calder Valley area of Yorkshire. She's experienced, she's straight talking, she's a sergeant, an arresting woman, if you will, who is bold, she is markedly adept at her job, she's physically fit, determined, and she thrives on essentially chasing down and arresting criminals. Um, so we see her as incredibly competent, but Catherine's life outside of her work is much more complex. And in the opening episode, when trying to persuade a teenage drug and alcohol addict called Liam not to set fire to himself in the local children's playground, she tries to make an emotional connection with him, or perhaps a class connection. She says, uh, and it's, it, it's, it's a great sort of sequence. She says, I'm Catherine, by the way. Uh, I'm divorced. Uh, I live with my sister, who's a recovering heroin addict. I have two grown-up children, one dead and one who doesn't speak to me, and a grandson. So, And this is essentially her introduction. Now, while these personal facts are announced with a bluntness that works to deny emotion, they are used to highlight and to suggest Catherine's lived experience of class, or at least that's what I'd like to suggest. And this is something that academic scholars Anita Baresi and Heather Nunn refer to as the emotional and experiential dimensions of contemporary class lives, and they're particularly important here. Um, Catherine K. Wood's messy personal life and indeed her history um, is revealed not only for the purposes of exposition, and indeed that sequence is beautiful and very effective in the way it does that, but I want to suggest that it's revealed in that way in order to render her class status and her lived experience visible. Um, as a female television crime lead, Catherine is nothing perhaps like the slick middle-class police officers that have tended to dominate British television drama, and um, particularly prestige crime drama. So we might want to think about London-based uh, detective chief inspector Jane Tennyson in Prime Suspect, um, obviously played by Helen Mirren, uh, Gillian Anderson, uh, who we can see here as well, um, who played uh, detective superintendent Stella Gibson in The Fall, um, or Detective Janet Scott, um, who, played, um, uh, who was played by Leslie Sharp in Scott and Bailey, again, a sort of uh, police series. Catherine Kaywood, who we can see at the bottom, is, is different for, from these women, not just aesthetically, but in different ways as well. We can see an aesthetic difference in that, whereas we can see a, a polish in relation to the way in which these, these, these women at the top present themselves and are presented to us as these lead female detectives, um, Catherine is presented very differently in lots of ways. Um, uh, firstly, of course, um, we see her on the street doing her job. Um, she is essentially um, a, a street working police officer um, and that I think in lots of ways is really helpful in order to aid her identity um, as um, somebody who is perhaps of a slightly different class. It brings this issue of class to the floor, to the, to the, to the fore. She's a female lead um, in the same way that these other female television leads are but she's doing something slightly different. She's got the same rank in some cases, um, but yet she's in uniform, she's walking on the beat, she's enjoying being a part of her community. So there's a sort of difference here. What Catherine and Kaywood, Kaywood sees in her own community is both its extreme beauty and its extreme ugliness. Um, and she recognises that both of those things coexist in terms of place. Um, she lives and works in her community, there's no separation between the two. Um, and she knows her community because she is indeed a part of it. So place is really important here. She knows um, the streets, she knows the, the alleys, the snickets of Happy Valley, which is essentially a place in the diegesis and in the real world known as Hebden Bridge, so a real-life place. 
Um, Catherine Kaywood is very happy um, on the streets. Um, she's unhappy in when she actually goes into the police station and on the streets outside doing her job interacting with people is where essentially we see her most emotionally attuned. Um, as a police detective then she's one that's figured uh, as both a known type, she is um, a, a, a stock female lead character in lots of ways, a stock female detective, you know she's, she's both hard and soft at the same time but she is doing something different, so she, she's different from these well-worn figures. Um, she is a detective who is happiest, as I said, on the beat, and who is also proud to do work which might be considered to be of a lower grade. So she's essentially doing work that might be attributed perhaps to a constable rather than a detective. And there's something interesting about her class position and her, her, her real enjoyment and reveling in that here, um, which I think is interesting to bring to the fore. Um, Catherine deals with lots of issues. Um, some of these involve uh, addiction and, and in lots of ways addiction is written into the textual fabric of the community here and um, we see this from the opening scene. Um, there is um, the, the teen that I referred to earlier that Catherine is trying to rescue who's drunk and high um, so we get this notion of the sort of troubled teen. We also get Catherine referring to the fact that one of her own children is dead and the other refuses to speak to her. Her sister's a heroin addict. We recognise that addiction sort of is permeating this community in lots of ways and perhaps that that's also linked to class. These troubles, particularly around um, drug addiction and heroin addiction, represent in some ways a sort of generic framework, okay, a sort of ostensibly generic framework um, of crime drama. But they also indicate classed problems born of a specific place, a real place. And as I say, this is essentially Hebden Bridge in the Calder Valley. The troubles in this valley are very place specific. Um, this is a place in the north of England, it's a town um, where employment outside of the main factories is scarce, it's a place that's geographically um, interesting, beautiful but also challenging, particularly in relation to drug distribution, in, in part owing to having sort of vast open landscapes and hills as well as waterways which make uh, importation and movement of, of drugs particularly challenging for communities to prevent. Um, so this is a place where there's also um, uh, drug uh, and drink issues which we can see in this particular drama and we can also see those through perhaps um, uh, instability in relation to families and also employment. So class is in many ways absolutely written into part of the um, both corrosive problems of addiction here but, but into um, the other interesting opportunities that this place offers up. Um, the drugs that permeate this community, of course, though, are not high-end, so we're not talking about cocaine here, we're talking about low-grade heroin, cheap cider, and so on. Through the focus, um, uh, through the focus in terms of the story on Catherine, on her grief, um, on her desire to serve justice on a, on a recently released felon, Tommy Lee Royce, um, Happy Valley allows for and weaves into the sort of lived experience um, of Catherine's class life. We see lots of really interesting uh, backdrops. We see um, terraced houses, we see cobbled streets, um, and, and these things are given time on screen. But there is a sort of um, a, a strange um, uh, mix of both the rural and the industrial um, that um, is problematic for both the community itself and is presented um, in a way that sort of opens up communities perhaps to um, the, the, the challenges um, of um, uh, employment and actually having um, something outside of that that maybe younger people as well can look toward. Happy Valley or Hebden Bridge as it's represented is, is presented as this troubled town um, but while we have drug problems um, in this town, 
it's not homogenous, particularly in relation to um, addiction and social class. So we get a real range of characters having and embodying different class experiences. So they come across a spectrum from affluent upper middle class factory owner, Neverson Gallagher, to homeless heroin addicts. Um, some of the community work, some of the community don't, some are self-employed, some are not. Um, the place of Calder Valley while troubled by perhaps its own geographical limitations, is also a place of beauty, it's a place of breathtaking landscape. Um, as I say, it's a place full of character, of well-to-do as well as down and out lives. Um, class isn't only made visible uh, in, in, in Happy Valley, but it also works intersectionally with gender politics to offer up, I think, a really compelling nar narrative about the often doubly difficult lives of women who are expected and, in fact, frequently fail to successfully enact their roles as both mothers or carers and um, economised women, economised workers. Um, their labor, and in particular, their emotional labor, um, women's emotional labor that is, is, is exposed in, in Happy Valley, both in relation to um, the paid um, uh, work um, that um, uh, women are seen to undertake, where that exists. There's also, of course, issues with a, a lack of um, uh, employment, and in relation to the home, the domestic setting. So this sort of social fabric and weight of social expectation is often violently pushed and pulled front and centre in the series. Women in this series are seen not only as responsible for their own labour and behaviour, but also for the labour and behaviour of generally their husbands, their sons, their daughters, siblings and colleagues too. What Sally Wainwright, the writer, refuses to shy away from consistently is a breaking point or various breaking points in relation to Catherine and indeed other characters. So these moments of absolute despair, women's emotional and classed experiential labor is troubling in the serial, but it is there and it's made visible. Like the town itself, it seems that there's very little possibility of getting away from that. But in Happy Valley, the women have to go on. They actually don't have a choice here. The expectations on them to um, do their work, to do women's work, to do emotional work, doesn't cease in moments of crisis. In fact, it's sort of exacerbated frequently, meaning that they have to go back, they have to do more. They essentially have to know their place as both breadwinner and as carer. It's important to note, I think, in relation to this, this, this series, that the women in the series are not without power. They are powerful agents. Um, but um, uh, um, these women show, uh, sorry, and these women show great stamina. They are constantly, however, knocked down. So it's quite violent as a, as a sort of series. We, we constantly see women being bloodied and bruised and abused. But what they do is they repeatedly sort of get back up again. They do more work. They have another go. Um, the abuse of women, however, isn't only restricted to this geographical place. And Sally Wainwright, as I said, has deliberately set this in a real life place. She wants people to recognize this. She said that's essential for the authenticity but it's also brought out in relation to another storyline. So, for example, in series two, we see the police rescue, rescue uh, 22 uh, women who've been trafficked from Croatia to work in a local biscuit factory. So, again, what the series does is it, it sort of uses um, uh, class and women and this intersectionality, both literal and me metaphorical, to really bring out social issues. Though social class, and in particular, um, the, the poverty that sort of blights this community in a way, um, are interesting, and the interesting facts in relation to identity of K. Wood and of the series, I think perhaps one of the most interesting things about Catherine is not so much what her own class status is, but her work as an agent and an agent of empathy to be able to think through and sympathize as well as to, to, to empathize with people who have a different lived experience of class from her. 
Um, so, for example, in Series 2, when it becomes known that prostitutes in the area, um, local prostitutes are being uh, attacked at random, Catherine goes out to warn the young women, and she says, you know, she takes them a sandwich and she says, look, please be careful, you know, this is going on. Later in that particular episode, when her more junior female colleagues don't enact that same duty of care to protect these women, these girls, Catherine sort of really explodes in anger, noting about Leone. Leone is not just a prostitute. She's a vulnerable 19-year-old girl who is where she is because she's had a shit life. Um, so essentially what we get here is this acknowledgement of where she is, Leone's shit life. And this is meaningful on multiple levels. On the surface, it displays Catherine's empathy for those in a different social position to herself. Rather than looking down on Leone, Catherine is clearly able to see why she's made the choices that she had. And she recognises that it's often class privilege, or the lack thereof, that acts as a shield to somebody and a stick to beat others with. On a second level, Catherine's use of that phrase, where she is, points to a deep understanding of space and the specificity of it that is brought out by Sally Wainwright here. Place is important in Happy Valley. While generically familiar as a crime drama, Wainwright basically ensures that the landscape in which the serial is set is recognisable. Hebden Bridge, as I said, is a real place, and speaking of her decision to locate her story there, she said it couldn't be believable anywhere else. In part, this is to do with the language, the rhythms of people's um, uh, speech, the way in which they interact. It's about a knownness of each other and a knownness of the place. Place is important, and the recognition of this specificity is, is what Lamont refers to in academic scholarship as boundary work. While the troubled town of Hebden Bridge is made visible in this television series, um, the serial does not articulate a closing down of borders, but rather suggests that you know, borders need to be understood in relation to a thoughtful, nuanced recognition of lived experiences of class and place, as well as a recognition of the ways in which those inequalities can be evidenced across and over borders. Thank you, Beth. Um, so I'm going to continue talking about the relationship between place and class as kind of central and formative um, in British television culture and clearly in British political culture more broadly. So I want to speak a little about... Um, this is England. <clears throat> Shane Meadows' series, particularly This is England 86, 88 and 1990, some of the most popular and critically successful um, recent prestige dramas in Britain. May between 2010 and 2015 for Channel 4, they won multiple BAFTA awards and maintained a high audience share throughout their runs. Um, as I said, critically received very well. The series marked a return to quality TV drama for Channel 4, or at least that was what was stated. They were commissioned following the cancellation of Endemol's Big Brother franchise. And Channel 4 explicitly stated that the resource that they previously allocated to reality television was now being directed towards these ambitious new drama projects, such as This Is England. The series are sequels to this film, um, This Is England, made in 2006. And the film is focused, really, a character study on this character in the centre, Sean Fields, who's an obvious avatar for Shane Meadows, the director. A 13-year-old boy, is played by Thomas Turgoose, he's dealing with the recent loss of his father um, in England in 1983 during the Falklands conflict. His father's been killed during that war. And when he's befriended by a benevolent uh, skinhead, Woody, and his friends, um, he finds a new sense of purpose. He quickly embraces the style and camaraderie of this new subcultural alternative family. But the group splits when Combo returns from prison, um, who is a, uh, a previous member of that group, who's developed very fervent nationalistic views. Seizing upon Sean's desire for a new father, for a new way of seeing the world, he, he draws in the youngster, and Sean is temporarily uh, con consumed um, by this racist narrative, because it's one that makes him, helps him to make sense of his father's death. The film ends brutally, for those of you who have not seen it. Combo beats one of the mixed-race members of the group, Milky, in front of Sean, within an inch of his life, 
and Sean then throws his English flag into the sea, symbolically uh, rejecting the nationalism that had previously consumed him. Now, the television series move away from that sole focus on Sean, so there's a generic shift there. The focus kind of necessarily shifts into a, a wider narrative dispersal uh, across um, a range of, an, an ensemble of characters, I'm not, I'm kind of this group. So we move away, actually, from those questions of national identity, which are focused on a single character, from those questions, actually, of class politics, um, and towards, perhaps, a more domestic focus. There's a particular focus in the series um, on uh, familial abuse and cycles of domestic abuse and the resultant trauma that characters live with. There's also, rather strangely and perhaps incongruously, um, a focus on kind of fantastical comedy as well and a very, very stylized representation of this wider ensemble group's kind of subcultural representation over time, over England in the 1980s to the 1990s. So the generic shift that was enacted from film to television can in part, I think, be explained by Meadows' recruitment of television collaborators for the series. So his co-writer on all three series is Jack Thorne, who had previously written for Skins and for Shameless, um, and the director of the first two episodes is Tom Harper, who'd worked with Thorne and Thomas Turgis, actually, on a film, Scouting Book for Boys, in 2009. And he'd also directed this drama, Misfits, uh, made for Channel 4 between 2009 and 2013. Meadows then chose those collaborators who had experience of television, and I think that impact can really be felt in the serial and probably has interesting um, impacts on the relationship um, that the series have with the representation of social class. So this England text then can be read alongside those series, like Shameless, like Skins, like Misfits, of exponents of what Faye Woods, the academic writer, calls skewed social realism, which is threaded through with a strong comic voice and a fondness for the fantastical. So this is as distinct from perhaps cinematic traditions of realism in Britain. Woods identifies some of the ways in which, for example, Misfits, in the top left there, blends its embrace of the fantastical with an engagement with social realist visual codes. And what she's talking about here um, are examples of, and could be identified through the series' very conspicuous use of brutalist architecture. The series is located in a very conspicuous fashion around the Thamesmead estate in South East London. This estate, however, this is a crucial point for this presentation, is never named. So unlike what Beth was talking about, this is non-specific focus on place. The characters' accents are also very varied, so as to diffuse the possibility of geographical specificity, and that has real impacts on the representation of class. This is really noteworthy and significant as well in This Is England, which likewise uses a never-named location. We never know where This Is England is set and draws its characters again from across the north of England and the Midlands with no specificity of accent, of dialect. These generalised and generic landscapes ground these serials, dramatic elements, within a visual iconography that appears to exude a kind of quotillion familiarity, but it's one which is necessarily loose. So there's a tension then when these real spaces, particularly spaces which are kind of rich in complex socio-political and cultural histories <clears throat> are mined for these very general purposes to, in effect, authenticate fictional narratives. So the use of setting in, in This Is England is a very clear example of this. The sense of This Is England as this kind of transmedia narrative, almost a franchise, operating amongst and within a range of these imaginary geographies is really powerfully illustrated through the shift in location from the film to the serials. So the film was made in Nottingham, and was also shot in and around Grimsby. Um, and the film, uh, and the series rather, is, is, is made in Sheffield. So the transition from film to television is a seamless transition from one location to another. We as an audience suspend our disbelief. The landscapes change very obviously, but the characters remain exactly the same. In both the film and the TV sequels of This Is England, the locations never play themselves. They are mobile, they are malleable. So what's produced across both the film and the televised series is an assemblage of regionalised working class spaces yoked together in a kind of palimpsest to generate an illusion of a single coherent location. And that has some quite significant connotations for the representation of class in these series. 
this refusal to be grounded by a specific geography or a specific temporal framework is clearly also a key ingredient of their universal appeal. The idea that this is England is really anywhere and any time England, not one particular place and one specific time. It means that audiences don't have to have a specific engagement with or an understanding of a particular location to engage in that fiction. This is rendered quite problematic when it comes into the conflict with the very narratives that are woven into these real and existing landscapes. This prevents a, a, a fundamental issue of class representation in television drama more broadly, when locations which exist as articulations of class identity, namely in England and Britain, council estates, are divorced from their specificity, and then are, but are offered up as photogenic backdrops rather than as real, complex spaces which contain within them ongoing, continuous struggles of working and underclass life in Britain. So what we're thinking about here is class representation as style and not as substance, a loose signifier of class, if you will. So just as in Misfits, This Is England exploits the great effect, the presence of arresting modernist architecture, and particularly uh, in the location of Sheffield, um, specifically uses the Park Hill Flats, some of the finest examples of post-war Corbusier-inspired brutalism in Britain, and the huge Gleadless Valley estate. Gleadless Valley is used extensively in the first series. Um, it's the estate on which two of the central characters, Woody and Lowell, live, houses the church, which is used in, their, in the final episode to stage their aborted wedding. And the dramatic, dramatic vistas that the estate generates are used to kind of punctuate the narrative throughout the series, often breaking uh, with commercial breaks, a punctuating point uh, after advertising breaks. And they're put to particular effect in kind of designating the changing of seasons and the passing of time. So a very general use of location, but a very specific place. In one sense, the prominence and the continual reassertion of these spaces as non-specific but paradoxically authentic markers of a particular partic political project can be seen to be Meadows drawing lines of continuity between the depicted past and the contemporary socio-political situation, kind of making visible a nostalgic longing for a lost sense of community. In this sense, the buildings could be seen to operate as symbolic entities, almost as ruins of a lost future, and depicting on them on screen might allow Meadows to realise their haunting presence in our own everyday lives as we pass them. They make visible, perhaps, the residual traces of collective life that feel increasingly remote in a deeply privatised contemporary political landscape, in England at least. For this to work, however, these places would need to be named and recognised. They would need to play themselves as characters in their own right. So the specifics of their locations might in turn be realised, be dramatised. <clears throat> Sheffield's proximity to the Peak District means that more than any other city in Britain, it juxtaposes green space with residential housing. And its very hilly topography means that arresting views which draw into focus living space alongside more untamed landscapes are very common. That's a very specific feature of the Sheffield landscape. And these series capitalise on these visual qualities. But in conflating the locations, in disrupting their geographical and temporal specificities, their particular narratives of class as markers of the relationship between environment and identity are lost. And just as an example of this, we can see there the way those landscapes on the left are used in the film, those landscapes on the right with the same characters in completely different settings are used in the series. So two different spaces, but occupying apparently the same narrative. And that's, these are images of the Gleadless Valley estate. So these locations represent very significant examples of specific moments in the history of post-war Britain and in the history of class in Britain as well. The ways actually in which class is made visible in the British landscape, they're markers of that history. But here, Meadows unmoors them from their specific place within history and they're instead redeployed as arresting, yes, but very limited features of this generalised English landscape, this idea of this is England, not this is Sheffield or this is Yorkshire. The serials all revel in the vistas produced by the estate's relationships with the rolling hills that surround them and contrasts between 
the sharp-edged modernism and the spectacular green spaces. We might think here of um, the shots of Lowell as she pushes her daughter at, um, in a pram up the hill at the start of 88 with this vast estate in the background. And soon after, the same view being used to frame the weary milk ears, he returns from working away, carrying a, an oversized teddy bear for the same child. But these images, I think, work at the level of, of decoration because they're complementing rather than interacting with and informing these, these characters' highly domesticated and arguably quite depoliticized narratives. Now, the Park Hill Estate, which is located closer to the city centre in Sheffield, is similarly aestheticized in the film, in the series rather. You can see it in the top left and how it's used in the series there. <clears throat> it's where two of the central characters in this thing, the 90 Gadget and Harvey, live. But it carries with it, Park Hill, a very specific heritage as an iconic example of post war British architecture. It's been listed by English Heritage <clears throat> and it's currently undergoing a very significant redevelopment process, which you can see on the bottom right there. The first phase of this has been to see that many of the fat flats previously available as social housing are now upmarket dwellings. <clears throat> and while some social housing remains, the flats now house local design businesses, um, a cafe bar, an art gallery, <clears throat> and there are plans to convert a large section of the flats into private student accommodation. So at the time of writing, this location has an ongoing narrative life about class in Britain in 2018. One which speaks to very contemporary political and economic and social concerns and tells a very particular story about class in Britain. <clears throat> Excuse me. In episode three, for example, of 1986, the group play football outside these flats on the other side of the new development, which we can see in the top left there. The flats later provide a backdrop for a, a comedy flat fight between the gang and between Shaw, and Sean's sportswear-clad scooter-riding bullies. So these architecturally arresting spaces are made conspicuous within the serials. They're used, but these are real living spaces, as I say, with very specific kinds of histories, which are offered up here as kind of strange collages of the past. And the football sequence is literally layered with archival footage of England's 1986 World Cup campaign. So this representation of the states as past spaces is kind of, in a complex way, intersects with um, the ongoing stories that are told by Park Hill today. What we see is a tension then between the space as mere imagery and as a real environment which contains with it multiple narrative lives. So there's perhaps a question, I think, of something problematic about me raising these questions about the transformation of these real locations into collages of imagined geographies. I'm informed by my own subjectivities. As I said at the start, I work and live in Sheffield, almost exactly in between these two estates. So I see them every day. So my engagement with them is layered with my own personal narrative. But I want to suggest that despite this series of apparent assertions of authenticity, which in Shane Meadows' work emerges from the very naturalistic performance of the characters, from the use of his own biography um, as a narrative resource, and from this apparently authentic use of space, at least at the surface level, there is a tension still in their impressionistic use of these actual locations. This tension exists precisely because of the subjectivities that are involved in interpreting a piece of television drama. Our own experience of these places intersects um, with Meadows' uh, very generic use of the spaces. It invites us to reflect upon and call upon our own lived experiences. And so, to illustrate this point, I want to call upon the journalist Paul Mason's discussion of This Is England in The Guardian, in 19, uh, of This Is England 90, rather, in The Guardian. Mason argued that the series functioned as a, a powerful evocation of Thatcherism and its corrosive legacies. He said that This Is England 90 captured the period before the present neoliberal moment, this seemingly irreversible sense um, of a loss of community and the good life and of a collective idea. This is what it was like just before we got divided into the saved and the damned, he says, when you could still riot without a balaclava, walk into a job centre with your head held high, and when a whole family could, if it had to, live on the earnings of a dinner lady. So this is a very um, class-focused reading of the series. But I think, like myself, Meadows is bringing his own experiences of these locations to the analysis. Uh, Mason, rather, is bringing his own experience of these locations. He was a student in Sheffield in this period, in the 1980s. 
And so his reading of the location in specific terms originates from his prior experience of it. There's no explicit, explicit mention of Sheffield in the series. Perhaps um, for many of you who have not visited Sheffield, you would not know at all that it was taking place in Sheffield. Mason then brings his own experience of Sheffield to read it as Sheffield. For example, much of his article is based on Mason's incorrect assertion that This Is England 90, the third series, was filmed on this estate. He argues that the representation of class politics emerged from a specific engagement with that specific estate. He talks about the deprivation figures on that specific estate, and he uses it as an, example, as, as an anchor rather, for his speculative discussion of how the characters might fare in present-day Britain. Yet although this estate is used as a backdrop in 86 and in 88, by 1990, none of the characters live there. It's only shown in punctuating shots. Mason's comprehension is fundamentally mistaken. The point is not merely to identify that he's got it wrong, but to say that it exposes the ease with which Meadows' imagined geographies of anywhere England can be misinterpreted. For Mason, this is not anywhere England. It's Sheffield in 1990. It's in a specific time and a specific place. He reads it as an examination of Sheffield through the Thatcher years, and that reveals his own politics, actually. He's written extensively about the dangers and utopian possibilities of automation, of the digital future. He's a fierce critic of neoliberalism. He's a vocal supporter of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party. But the malleable landscapes and characters of This Is England 90 animate and give shape to Mason's politics rather than the other way around. The points he uses to evidence his interpretation are not drawn from the text. The character's employment status in This Is England is never explored. No one, as I say, lives on this estate. There are no job centres in the serial. We don't see them struggling to find work. Mason's analysis then reveals the tensions inherent in this non-specific use of location. His politicised reading emerges not from what the series presents to him in terms of class representation, but from a, a pre-existing analysis that he unwillingly projects onto This Is England's loose, politically ambiguous and unspecified landscape. So the fact that these serials are produced by Sheffield-based Warp Films and by Screen Yorkshire is clearly one of the determining factors in that move of the film from Nottingham to Sheffield. Um, yet these pragmatic production considerations bring with them, I hope I've argued, very particular issues of representation. Location matters. Inequalities in class politics are spatialised and visualised through the rendering of these particular landscapes on screen. For their treatment of location, television dramas can intervene in and perpetuate the politics of representation. These are real spaces that are presented on screen, and they contain within them very real and ongoing narratives of social class that exist above and beyond the boundaries of the dramatic space. Okay, so to draw to a conclusion, the case studies, the two case studies that we've examined today, so we're thinking about um, at Happy Valley in particular, and also the This Is England uh, spin-off, the television series, um, engage with and speak to issues of class in both specific ways and also in very generic ways. They, 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 they work covertly and overtly. Um, to conclude, I suppose it's important that we go back to those initial research questions that we, that we had at the, very, at the very beginning of this presentation and of the book more broadly. Um, so what can we summarise from, from these two case studies and indeed from the research from the book at large about what the state of research is in relation to contemporary British television dra genre, drama even? What can we learn about identity from this television drama of the last 20 years? In what ways do television texts perform or resist these particular um, ideological positions? What can television drama do with and to class? Is class identity or struggle utilised as a dramatic device in contemporary television drama? And how can class be identified in the textual fabric and form of television? And what can it make us feel? Our research, both that presented here and more broadly that encompassed in the book, has shown that social class remains a critical preoccupation in and on contemporary British television. 
while drama is increasingly and successfully, I think in many cases, moving toward geographical specificity, so for example, Hebden Bridge in relation to Happy Valley or Birmingham uh, in relation to, say, Peaky Blinders. What's also clear is that um, uh, in these instances, and be perhaps because of the lived experiences of class, class is harnessed to place. It's depicted and represented more subtly now in contemporary era than it was in the past. And this harnessing may well be a, a really significant part of that. Contemporary British television drama that's moored by place tends therefore through its main characters to display an empathy in relation to class difference or class inequalities. Place and class as positive lived experiences are increasingly recognized to be a matter of luck and of privilege rather than as something anchored by a moral superiority. Um, and the emotional intimacy that we often feel with contemporary television dramas um, might indeed be a response to a speaking of this particular truth in and about class. Where and when geographic specificity <laughs> is not evidenced in contemporary television drama, so for example in This Is England, that's not to say, however, that class is not important to the story or stories being told. While the borders of those places may be sketched out more loosely, class identity or struggle is utilized as a dramatic device to point to a more generic understanding of national troubles. While this creates specific issues in relation to failings in, in terms of recognition of class tied to lived experience, particularly, and space specificity, particular times, for example, what it also demonstrates, I think importantly, is that um, troubles travel beyond borders. And perhaps it aims to make a larger point, perhaps the texts which don't specify location um, aim to make a larger point about the spillage between places and the overlap um, between problems of the past and problems of the present. The textual fabric and form of television is a rich tapestry on which stories, lived experiences, um, imaginaries, social issues, social provocations and activisms can be made and remade. Televisual style is significant and it can and is utilised to key out the complexities of the local and the national and international identities. Um, when style, however, is given precedence over substance, nuances in relation to those identity and identity politics are missed and they're rendered invisible. Television is a political medium and its politics in contemporary Britain continue to be bound to ideas um, around and of social class. More broadly, our research has pointed to the fact that class on and in British television drama is rarely articulated as a single issue, but is increasingly being understood to operate intersectionally, bringing women's stories in particular to the fore. Our research also tells another story, however, and that is that on the whole, contemporary British television drama is still dominantly understood as white. This is a narrative that needs to be rectified, both through industry policy in relation to BAME personnel and on screen itself. And perhaps this, more than any other narrative, is the most urgent, is the, most, is the one story most in need of recognition and of change and of repair. Okay, thank you.